tax freight train is bearing down on your retirement. To protect yourself, you'll have to harness the power of zero. Welcome to the Power of Zero show. I am your host, David McKnight, best-selling author of The Power of Zero, Look Before You Lerp, The Volatility Shield, and Tax-Free Income for Life. If you're looking for someone to help you navigate all of the pitfalls that stand between you and the 0% tax bracket, head on over to davidmcknight.com. Happy to hook you up with a member of our elite POZ advisor group among the very best tax-free retirement specialists in the nation trained, vetted, qualified personally by me. If you're an advisor looking to level up your game and incorporate all of the Power of Zero principles into your practice, you can head over to powerofzero.com, opt into a free three-part video series during which time you can set up an appointment to talk with us and we'd be happy to do so. I would love a follow on Twitter. It's at McKnight and co, at McKnight and co. If you follow me on Twitter, you can get all of the latest updates as far as tax legislation goes, as far as strategy goes. I post new articles there all the time. So, all right, let's jump into today's show. I'm going to talk about two things during today's show. The first thing I want to talk about is I want to talk about the true cost of Joe Biden's signature spending bill that also includes some tax legislation. He's talked about how that bill is cost neutral. In other words, he is increasing the tax on the wealthiest Americans to uh, completely offset the cost of this, of his additional spending. And so uh, what I'm going to be doing is looking at an article from Maya McGinnis. She sent it out in her uh, newsletter. And remember, Maya McGinnis is someone I've interviewed on my own show. She is a president of the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget. And she put a pen to paper and said, okay, is this really cost neutral in the truest sense of the word? And if not, what is driving these additional expenses? So let's get into just a a brief summary of what Maya has said. And then I will add in a few comments of my own. She basically says, look, the Build Back Better Act, which is the name of the legislation that, uh, that Biden is pushing, it is cost 2.1 trillion as currently written. Now remember, Bernie Sanders wanted six trillion. Joe Biden originally wanted on the order of three trillion. That didn't fly, so they've cut it down. And currently it's on the order of 1.9 trillion, something like that. So basically what she says is, is that $1.9 trillion plan cost $2.1 trillion. I'll get into what why there's that two hundred billion dollar discrepancy here in a little bit. She says, however, the bill relies on a number of sunsets and expirations to keep the official costs down. If the plan's temporary policies were made permanent, we find the cost would increase by as much as $2.2 trillion. As a result, the gross cost of the bill would more than double from $2.1 trillion to $4.3 trillion. So let me translate this into plain English for you. Basically, what she's saying is that a lot of times when the federal government tries to make bills seem cost neutral on paper, they do they, they make various components of the program expire or sunset a few years into the legislation. And they do this full well knowing that Americans will get hooked on these programs. OK, it could be a program, you know, it could be a tax credit for children. We'll get into what, what all of these different programs are. Uh, but get hooked on these programs in the meantime and then demand that they be renewed once they expire. So I think Maya McGinnis is justified in thinking that it's a bit disingenuous on the part of the Biden administration to say that this program is cost neutral because they're likely going to be using some gimmicks. And remember, Maya McGinnis is not a partisan hack. She has Democrats and she has Republicans on her board. She's just trying to figure out the best way forward that's most fiscally viable for our country and not just keep piling on on all of that. So she basically says, look, she can see it coming from a mile away. They've built in these gimmicky little expirations and sunsets to reduce the cost of the program, full well knowing that these are likely going to be made permanent somewhere down the road. So it's just sort of a, a gimmick that they use to make these things more palatable on the front end, knowing that it's going to cost more and add to debt over time. So let's talk about some of the programs that are being sunset or expired in there. Uh, So the Build Back, according to Maya, the Build Back 
better act relies on a number of arbitrary sunset expirations to lower the official cost of the bill. We've mentioned that. These include extending the American Rescue Plan's child tax credit increase and earned income tax credit expansion for a year and setting universal pre-K and child care subsidies to expire after six years. So these are things that are likely to be around for the long term and they are expiring them uh, just a few, few years into the program. The most expensive provision to extend, the one-year $1,000 increase in the child tax credit for children six and up, and the $1,600 increase in the credit for children under six would cost roughly $1 trillion to make permanent. They estimate the extending, that extending universal pre-K and the child care subsidies beyond 2027 will cost over $400 billion on a combined basis. She has one more paragraph here that talks about other things that, could, that, that, that are currently set to expire or sunset that will likely be extended. She says, excluding potential changes to the state and local tax SALT deduction, we estimate the Build Back Better Act would cost $2.1 trillion as written. We estimate making all these temporary policies permanent would cost roughly $2.2 trillion, more than doubling the gross cost of the bill to $4.3 trillion through 2031. There's a number of other provisions in here that she mentions are likely to be re-upped once they expire several years into the legislation. So she says, as written, we estimate the Build Back Better Act would increase deficits by $800 billion over the first five years and a total of $200 billion through 2031. She says it would reduce deficits by roughly $600 billion in the second five years. So it starts off with a huge deficit and then as deficits uh, reduce over time, then ultimately the net cost is $200 billion, which, you know, in the big scheme of things, given $30 trillion of debt, that's not the end of the world. And I think that you could take Biden at the spirit of his word, which is this is roughly cost neutral, only $200 billion over 10 years, not a big deal, given the size and scope of the federal government. However, what she's really saying, she says, look, if the legislation were made permanent without additional taxation without raising of additional revenue over time, it would add nearly 1.5 trillion to deficits over five years and increase total debt by $3 trillion through 2031. All right. So in conclusion, she says the Build Back Better Act relies on a substantial amount of short-term policies and arbitrary sunsets to reduce its costs, raising the possibility of deficit finance extensions in future years. A more robust and fiscally responsible package would not only rely on these, would not rely on these gimmicks to achieve deficit neutrality. So folks, the long and the short of it is this. Although this has been sold to us as a cost neutral bill, if the government ends up making permanent the provisions in the plan, that are currently set to expire sunset, then the cost of the program essentially doubles. And, the, and since the bill only calls for enough tax increases to cover the cost of the bill as written, and any extension of these provisions would essentially add an additional $3 trillion to the debt by 2031. So let me just sort of put that into perspective for you. Let's say that the debt, and I think this number is pretty close, let's say the debt is on pace to be $40 trillion by 2031. That means that if this bill went through in its current form and they extended all of those programs that are currently set to sunset or expire a few years into the program, then they would have to pay for the difference with debt. They would just have to pile it on the national credit card, which means that the real debt would instead be $43 trillion by 2031. So this has the effect if what happens with this bill is what's happened in the past. If history serves as a model, if passes prologue, we're gonna see an extra $3 trillion on the national debt if this ends up going through. Now, as you know, as I've said in, in past podcasts, I am skeptical as to whether this legislation goes through. We have Kristen Cinema on the one hand who said that she is not interested in raising taxes. We have Joe Manchin on the other hand who has said that he, he doesn't wanna do anything with this bill until he understands the full implications of it after it gets scored by the Cong- Congressional Budget Office. And even then he's not real high on it. So it faces a number of significant hurdles. But what I wanted to do here today was just to lay out for you what the impact, the real impact of this bill would be if all of these temporary provisions get made permanent. Okay. So second part of our, po- our podcast, I want to talk about tax changes for 2022. These came out about five days ago. They usually come out end of October, uh, beginning of November. It's a little bit late 
Um, a little bit late for my uh, taste this year. They're about 10, to 10, 10 days to two weeks, a little bit uh, later than when they usually put these numbers out because we've got a lot of workbooks that we put out that we like our clients and prospects to be able to, to take a look at, but better late than never. So let's jump in with both feet, take a look at what these numbers are. The first thing that, that I, I want to tell you is that th this is affecting the tax year 2022. So this is what you'll use to prepare your 2022 tax returns in 2023. I'll start briefly with tax brackets. We got an inflation adjustment for the tax brackets. Because of higher than usual inflation in 2021, we saw a higher than usual increase index for inflation in these tax rates. I'm not going to get uh, I'm not going to get into all of the thresholds for every tax bracket. You can pull up the web, you know, you can do a Google search and pull up in 2 seconds, but these these tax brackets have indexed for inflation at a rate that's higher than what it has in the past. Okay, so and that speaks to the inflation that we've been seeing of late. Now, remember, everything that I tell you now could completely go out the window if Joe Biden gets his, his legislation through, because if he gets his legislation through, it could completely recast all of these numbers. Okay, it could eliminate some things that we're going to talk about today that you would currently enjoy if Joe Biden does not end up pushing his legislation through. Okay, let's talk about the standard deduction for uh, individuals, 12950 for married couples, it's $25,900. So a modest increase from twenty five one up to twenty five nine. dollars Let's talk about the personal exemption. We know that as of 2018, the personal exemption was done away with. The personal exemption is not coming back until 2026 under current law. And in 2026, the standard deduction will reduce and they'll bring back the personal exemption. It will have a net neutral effect. So people say, hey, Dave, what happens when they bring the personal exemption back? Well, they bring the personal exemption back, they're going to reduce the standard deduction. So it's going to feel like the same amount of tax savings for you and me. Capital gains tax rates uh, remain the same for 2022. But of course, the brackets uh, for the rates will change as with the federal income tax brackets. A state tax exemption, the federal state tax exemption for decedents dying in 2022 will increase to 12.06 million per person or 24.12 million for a married couple. How about the gift tax exclusion? Jumps from 15,000 in 2021 up to 16,000 in 2022. So nothing dramatic there. Roth IRA. The Roth IRA, once again, is not changing. Why is the Roth IRA not changing? Why is it not indexing to keep up with inflation? Because it would require a, an act of Congress. Okay. 401k doesn't have any such provision. Okay. It was built into the original law that these things can in index with inflation. That is not what happened with the Roth IRA. So maybe Joe Biden will sneak that into his legislation should it goes through that the Roth IRA will continue to index with inflation, but they just apparently just don't want to mess with it. So it's actually IRA and Roth IRA, the same. So you'll have $6,000 contributions under age 50, get an extra $1,000 catch up over age 50. All right, let's talk about 401k contribution limits, $20,500 for people under age 50. And you have a catch-up provision of $6,500 for people over age 50. That gets you to a total of $27,000. That's for Roth 401k, a traditional 401k, so on and so forth. So this is this could be 403b as well. So this is a, a fairly robust amount of money that you could contribute to a tax-free vehicle. Between you and your spouse, you can contribute $54,000 per year to a Roth 401ks in your respective companies. Total, cumulatively. All right, let's talk about Roth income, income limits. For 2022, it went up slightly from 204,000 to 214,000. Remember how this works. You have you have the ability to put to, to contrib contribute the full amount, $6,000 if you're younger than age 50, $7,000 if you're older than age 50, all the way up to $204,000. Once you start hitting $204,000 up to $214,000, wherever you fall in that continuum, then your the amount that you get to contribute to your Roth IRA reduces commensurately. Give you an example. Let's say that your modified adjusted gross income is 209,000. So you're midway through that threshold of 204,000, that sliding threshold from 204 to 214. That means you can only contribute half the amount. So you're halfway through, you contribute half the amount to your Roth IRA. So if you're younger than age 50, you can contribute 3,000. If you're older than age 50, you can contribute 3,500. For a single person, 
that number is 129,000 all the way up to 144,000. By the way, this is something that I would really like to see changed. And the reason I want to see it changed is because, you know, $204,000 for someone in New York City is not the same as someone who's making $204,000 in, say, Grafton, Wisconsin, or somewhere in Kansas or what have you, where the costs of living are a lot lower. So it seems to me that it would make sense to start looking at a scenario where they maybe key this to a, a cost of living index in your in the respective state or community within which you live. Now, I'd like to make one other observation. They, they never mention this in um, any of the articles online when it comes to all of these various increases in, in tax thresholds. There has been no change in the provisional income thresholds. In other words, if you're single, it's 25 to uh, 34,000. That's the uh, threshold over which you can start having 50% tax, 50% of your social security tax, up to 85% of your social security tax. For married couples, it's 32,000 up to 44,000. Once you hit 44,000, then at that point, up to 85% of your social security can be taxed. They have not indexed this inflation, this for inflation in over 20 years, and it would take an act of Congress for them to index this amount. And, and the reason this is important, the reason this is important is because there are people in our country who rely on social security alone to be able to make ends meet. And they will get to a point. And remember, half of your social security counts as provisional income. So the so think of the little old lady, she's a widow, she's living exclusively on social security. Well, if her social security indexes to the point, let's say somewhere down the road, it hits $50,000. Well, guess what? If half of that social security is counted as provisional income. Now, all of a sudden, by dint of the growth of her social security over time, she now progresses to the point where half, you know, up to half of her social security can become taxable, in which case she gives back to the federal government a portion of her social security, which is a shame since that's what she's come to rely on exclusively. So I think there's a lot of people that are going to fit into that situation. And as inflation goes up and if, as they're required to increase social security to keep up with inflation over time, you're going to get a lot of people that that just naturally bump into social security taxation because of inflation. So again, no changes to provisional income thresholds. I always keep my ear to the ground every year to see if Congress is ever going to do. And I, and I imagine that once these people start calling their congressmen saying, look, my social security gain tax is the only thing that I can, that I have, that I rely on to pay for my basic living expenses in retirement. I think once people start falling into that category, letting their elected representatives know, we may see start to see some change on that. So that is the podcast for today. Uh, once again, if you want help navigating all of this, we'd be happy to help. Head over to davidmcknight.com. Happy to hook you up with a member of our elite POZ advisor group. If you are a financial advisor, you want to learn more about these uh, principles for your practice, head over to powerzero.com. And um, if you want to buy any of my books in bulk, you can head over to davidmcknightbooks.com, davidmcknightbooks.com. You can mix and match titles and achieve bulk discounts. Once again, if you want to follow me on Twitter, you can do so. It's at McKnight and Co. at McKnight and Co. Thanks, everybody, for being with me this week. We will look forward to chatting with you same time next week. <music>